Good morning. Thank you, Ricky and Constance and everyone else at uh, OCLC for inviting me. This has been a really interesting couple of days. Um, so we talked about, Catherine talked about, you know, not all scholars are created equal. Well, not all authors are created equal. Um, and so I'm going to talk about that. But first, um, I am from Digital Science, and I just wanted to say a few words about who we are if you don't uh, know much about Digital Science. We um, incubate and invest in startups generally coming out of academia um, that have a mission to address researcher pain points and make research smarter at various stages of the work cycle. So I'll just go quickly around that, that wheel to explain what these companies are. We've, we've talked about many of them over the last few days. But you probably haven't heard of Bioraft. Um, that is our laboratory safety and compliance uh, solution. LabGuru is our laboratory management solution, which um, makes it possible to capture laboratory data where it's, it's being created in the lab, um, along with protocols and other things. Um, you know about Figshare. That's our institutional repository that has enabled uh, researchers to share and preserve um, research data. Overleaf is the uh, newest member of the digital science family. It was previously called Write LaTeX, if you've heard of that. It's a collaborative authoring and publication platform built on top of tech. Um, Altmetric, you know about, that's our system for um, tracking downstream, but pre-citation attention paid to publications, you know, blogs and tweets and uh, news media downloads, et cetera. We've talked a lot about symplectic elements, so I won't go into that. We haven't talked about dimensions, and I actually think um, dimensions is, I think, will be of increasing interest to this community. Uh, dimensions is, has been um, mainly focused on the funding community. It's a business intelligence solution for funders, and it has probably the richest array of data and analytics about awarded funds globally of um, any solution that's out there, and is now being um, focused more on uh, business intelligence for institutions around funding data. And ReadCube is our enhanced PDF um, viewing and reading experience, which also has a library component to it. It has a kind of an e-commerce solution that makes it possible for libraries to set up pay-down accounts for article-based access as sort of a, an alternative to subscriptions to journals. Um, what's interesting about it, and I could give a whole talk about differentiated access is that there are different price points based on the type of access that you have. So you take, when people think about pay-per-view, they think about, oh, it's $35 an article. Well, what if it's $3 and you have access to it for 24 hours and no download and printing capability? So that's um, a bit about, about ReadCube. But I'm going to talk about something completely different. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about um, reputation management um, from the perspective of researchers and the pain of not receiving appropriate credit uh, for their contributions to collaborative research because of our longstanding authorship and attribution practices. Um, before the announcement of the 2013 Nobel Prize in, in Physics, there was a satirical posting in Scientific, Scientific American's blog um, reporting that Stockholm had announced that the award for the discovery of the particle would go to the particle itself because it wasn't clear which of the 6,000 people involved in the research actually deserved credit um, for the particle's discovery. Um, so, you know, we, our systems of authorship just are not up to the task of, of representing large-scale, you know, team science, basically. But co-authorship has always been um, ripe for abuse. I don't know, this is a sort of a list, a catalog of different types of authorship abuse coercion authorship, honorary or guest authorship, mutual support authorship, duplication authorship, ghost authorship, and then denial of authorship, um, none of which would come about in the case of, you know, sole authorship, but in fact, um, multi-authorship is on the rise, and the number of authors on papers um, is growing. Um, I actually... I became aware of this pretty early on in my own academic career. I was, uh, when I was a grad student at MIT, I was in cognitive science, but I kind of had one foot in the linguistics department. And I was, I think in my second year of grad school, able to publish a paper in the most prestigious journal at the time in linguistics, which was linguistic inquiry. Now, linguistic inquiry has the policy that if you have multiple authors, um, it def defaults to alphabetical order based on, you know, last name. 
I wasn't really aware of this, and so I had this project that actually turned into my dissertation. But I thought, oh, I'm writing this paper. It will be really fun to invite my friend, who knows a lot more about French than I do, um, to participate in, you know, in writing this paper with me. Well, her last name began with a D, and my last name at the time began with a P. Um, and so this, this work, which was so important for me as a graduate student, ended up with me not being first author, right? Um, which was rather traumatic for me. Um, and, um, you know, and I had good reason to be upset. Um, it actually turns out in fields like economics um, and social sciences generally, mathematics, in which the order of author names defaults to alphabetical, that you're actually more likely to get tenure in a prestigious department or win a prestigious prize if your last name begins with a letter earlier in the alphabet. That has been shown. Um, and so if you're, you know, Professor Altman in economics as opposed to Professor Zelaznik, you are going to be um, more successful. So this, this stuff really, really does matter, um, especially for, you know, younger uh, scientists and scholars, and especially as the number of authors on research papers is growing. So if you were to do a Google Scholar search on a term like author inflation, you would end up with a whole bunch of results like this, the demise of the lone author. Um, it turns out that sole authorship was the norm um, until about the 1920s, between the 30s and the 70s in the biomedical sciences. Uh, dual authorship, two authors, were the most common configuration you would see. And then from the 70s onward, it's just continued to creep upward so that by about 2000, the average number of authors on papers in the medical sciences was about um, seven. And you can see this growth happening almost in real time. So this is six plus journals um, where you can see between 2006 and 2013, for example, in the lower left one, the pink one, uh, plus medicine, the average number of authors grows from just under five to just under eight. Um, and it's increasing rapidly in many fields, such as physics, right, particle physics. Here we see, um, you know, it's not unusual to have papers with hundreds or thousands of authors um, representing hundreds of institutions. So this is from the Atlas experiment at CERN. Now, the interesting thing is whether you're author number one or author number 1,500, you can still include this paper on your CV, right? It's still going to count towards your H index, for example. Um, but if you are applying for a job or if you're up for review or you're submitting a grant proposal, there's a big difference between being author number one and author number 1,500. Um, I love this particular PhD comic. I'm sure you've all seen PhD comics before. Um, this is a good one giving credit where credit is due. So the first author is the grad student who prepared the figures, but they end up in first author position for whatever reason. Maybe they're about to go off on the job market. The third author is the first year student who did all the work um, and is just really happy to be included on the paper and don't even, doesn't really even care that they're in a middle author position. But we know that those middle author names are the ones that nobody reads. The last author is the person who never read the paper, but he's the head honcho and he provided the funding. Right, and last author is a prominent position. So this is, this is great because it really captures a lot of the culture of the laboratory and how these decisions are made and underscores the point that there's really no rhyme or reason to the order of author names in the byline. Um, there's no real truth or meaning here, and yet, you know, we persist in these practices. But who gets credit for research and discovery really does have a big impact on people's lives. Uh, it affects career advancement and tenure. It affects the transparency and integrity of the scholarly record, and yet we persist with these conventions for citation and authorship and credit that um, are so easily gamed and dysfunctional, with the result that authorship disputes abound. Um, in the publishing world, we have the Committee on Publication Ethics, which advises publishers on editors on cases of authorship dispute and misconduct. Um, and there are you know, several cases like this um, in this particular one, the author says that the individual making the complaint does not deserve to be an author, uh, or similarly. Uh, in this case, uh, authors are agreeing that someone contributed something, but not on whether or not they should be an author. Authors X and Y hold similar views as to what author Y's contribution was, but different views on whether this is sufficient for authorship. So, um, and that underscores the point, one of the points I want to come back to, which is that there's a difference between 
coming up with qualifications for what an author is and actually describing types of contribution. And my efforts are really focused on the latter. But there is um, a long history of work in medical journal publishing um, devoted to capturing contribution in relation to accountability. And that's not all that surprising when you, you know, think about medical science in relation to people's lives. Um, people's lives are at stake, so you know, who actually did these experiments? Who stands behind these results? Um, there's a long time JAMA, Journal of the American Medical Association editor, Drummond Rennie, who's really sort of considered to be the father of this work on contributorship. Um, he wrote back in 1997, the system of authorship, while appropriate for articles with only one author, has become inappropriate as the average number of authors of an article has increased. Um, Co-authors become more specialized, the relationships between them more complex, and credit and responsibility have become obscured and diluted. Um, so his work gave rise to, in part, um, something called the, the recommendations of the International Committee of Medical Journal Editors, which essentially define what, it, what you have to do to be an author in a medical journal article, and a lot of publishers have adopted these. So you have to meet all four of these criteria, make substantial contributions to the conception or design, uh, be involved in the drafting, approve uh, the final version, and agree to be accountable, essentially. So if you've done three of those things, but not four, then you shouldn't really be an author, but you could be called a contributor. Um, and so I'm just pointing this out because there has been some confusion about um, these recommendations and, and the work that I'm going to um, tell you about. Uh, these recommendations were not intended to describe different types of contribution. It's not what they were intended to do. They were intended to uh, create more of a culture of accountability um, in medical publishing. Um, so I myself first became interested in contribution when I was working um, at Harvard on tenure and promotion. Um, I was looking at the case of a, a biostatistician um, coming out of the School of Public Health whose record was kind of confusing. Um, he had, now at Harvard we have the luxury of um, being very qualitative in our tenure reviews. It was largely based on letters from faculty inside and faculty outside. And this was a person who, according to all of his letters, just walked on water, right? He was the leading methodologist in his field. But if you looked at his publication record, all it showed was someone who was middle author in all of his publications. Now, it's not too surprising for people that work in sort of statistics and methodology. They collaborate with a lot of other people who actually own the conception and design of, of their work. But I knew from experience that this kind of case was difficult for the presidential tenure committee to decide on. I mean, even though we were relying more on letters and stuff, it's, it just was so ingrained in people to be looking at these publication records and expecting to see you know, first author on a cell paper, first author on a nature paper, first author on a science paper, et cetera. Um, and so what I had uh, wished for on his behalf was that there was some way of showing, of tagging and capturing that he was lead methodologist on all of these papers. And I started looking at some of the practices um, in medical journal publishing and elsewhere and found that increasingly publishers were beginning to ask for either free text contribution statements or even in the case of some medical publishers defining, designing these controlled vocabularies um, and that there was a lot of consistency across them. So you see um, in one publisher saying, you know, if you're an author, you have to say whether or not you contributed to conception and design, acquisition of data, analysis and interpretation of data. Um, and the fact that this was emerging and there was a lot of consist consistency made me think that we it would be feasible to come up with a standard taxonomy of contribution, and that if we could get publishers to adopt this taxonomy, then we could um, spread the practice of capturing contribution and actually turn this into uh, machine-readable information, in other words, metadata. Um, and I discovered that several of my colleagues who had in, been involved in ORCID in the early days were also uh, very interested in this from other perspectives. Um, Liz. Um, Alan from the Wellcome Trust as a funder was very interested in capturing contribution. I worked with, on, on this with um, Michael Altman at the MIT Libraries. And so we held a workshop at Harvard uh, back in May of 2012 with stakeholders from, you know, publishers, librarians, researchers, even the provost office at Harvard, um, talking about and, and 
it was really the researchers that were, I think, telling the most compelling stories about what it's like in the lab in the absence of real, um, you know, practice around clarifying contribution early on in collaborative research. But we um, emerged from this workshop with a commitment to produce such a taxonomy. And um, we started by analyzing the free tax contribution statements in Nature publications. Nature um, has been requiring for about five or six years that all authors submit a statement saying, this is what, if you are an author, you know, what did you contribute to this work? And we also had access to Science Direct's um, acknowledgement sections to TextMine as well. And you can sort of see the things that emerge um, fairly consistently modeling, statistical, analysis, conceived, um, you know, design, um, supervision. Um, so that was, that led us to do a, a um, study that we ended up publishing in Nature about a year ago. Um, we got, with these participating publishers, uh, Nature, PLOS, eLife, Elsevier, 200 authors, corresponding authors, who had recently published papers agree to go back and recode the co-authors according to the taxonomy and then tell us about that experience. And the results were um, really um, overwhelmingly positive and I don't have time to go into all of them, but I just want to call out again because we're talking about why this matters to researchers, the sorts of things that people were telling us. You know, this was easy to do because we collectively agreed that the process is open to abuse by senior authors and we made sure that all the authors contributed equally. Um, or in another case, you know, there's an unstated belief in biology that only the person acquiring the funding should be the corresponding author. However, students and postdocs who contribute to the conceptual design could be corresponding authors too. Um, this is especially among younger um, scientists and scientists in sort of less traditional roles um, has been gaining a lot of traction. And so we've embarked on a more um, formal standard setting process under the auspices of NISA, which you've heard of, and also CASRAE. Um, CASRAE is the, uh, I always have to read it, Consortia Advancing Standards in Research Administration um, Information. And uh, we have the working group that you see here, representation from funders, um, institutions, um, publishers, certainly, um, and, and libraries as well. And we just published this taxonomy um, in the CASRAE Data Dictionary. So we, we arrived at 14 high-level roles that we think capture contribution in the sciences at a fairly high level. Um, the terms are conceptualization, methodology, software, um, and I, I'll come back to that, validation, you know, as in think about reproducibility and verification, formal analysis, investigation, resources, data curation, which could be, for example, a role that a librarian who's participating in a research project might, might play, um, writing the original draft, writing review and editing, visualization, supervision, project administration, and funding acquisition. Um, the last couple are kind of interesting. We're not saying that if all you did was uh, you know, contribute funding to a project that you should be considered an author. That's not the point of this. The point is that if that's all you did, then it should be transparent to readers that that's all that you did. Um, and whether or not you're an author is somewhat orthogonal to, to the transparency that we're trying to achieve. So it's, it's published the CASRAE Data Dictionary along with um, a couple of, of guidelines um, that, you know, that we envision the roles being called out, whether or not someone is listed as an author or only in the acknowledgments because we recognize, again, that different uh, journals and communities have different practices with respect to authorship. Um, and at the same time, we want to encourage um, recognition of non-traditional roles, such as software and data curation. So our theory is that if we begin to recognize the roles that haven't traditionally been authorship roles, then we can begin to shift values about um, scholarly merit. Um, and then for the purposes of providing some authority around this, um, our recommendation is that corresponding authors be charged with assigning these roles during the manuscript submission process. Again, this is somewhat journal-centric for now, um, but that the understanding is they will have consulted with all of the other uh, contributors. So the hope is that this transparency will eventually result in fewer authorship disputes. 
So we, we now have um, several pilots and early implementations underway. Um, Mozilla Science Labs, in partnership with Biomed Central, the open access publisher, has created a set of badges um, for the taxonomy so that when you're reading an article within Mozilla Browser, um, these badges, where the underlying data has been provided by the publisher, will show contribution of individual authors. The taxonomy is being integrated into the Vivo um, ISF ontology. Vivo is an open source research networking platform that in our discussions yesterday about uh, profiles and research networking, we didn't touch on Vivo, um, but um, they've been you know, involved in this project from the outset, and, and I'm, as I said before, or was mentioned, I'm on the Duraspace board, but imagine this information um, enriching the kinds of expertise search that you can actually do, so when you're searching you know, for someone to collaborate with at your institution, it's not just, okay, who works in nanotechnology, but, you know, which of those physical chemists are actually the, in charge of the methodology in, these, in, in this nanotechnology work, for example. Um, so you can get much more um, fine-grained, detailed information about expertise. Um, and it's another data type that adds intelligence to that kind of search functionality. Uh, the taxonomy is being integrated into ORCID, um, ORCID has um, a set of contributor roles that I remember at the time we kind of created in the absence of anything better a couple of, a couple of years ago, and they'll be moving away from that to the credit taxonomy. Because currently, if you look at this, and I don't think you can read this, there's sort of strange roles that are more like job functions. You know, so you, you know, graduate student, inventor, principal investigator, uh, postdoc, it's really not a contribution. So this is being integrated into ORCID. Um, there are some early uh, pilots with Crossref and also with Symplectic Elements um, and, and also with publishers because um, really the goal here is to have this be integrated into the publishing metadata ecosystem, right? So um, we are, uh, one important step is having the tags integrated into the NISO NCBI journal article tag suite or JATS, which is basically the the, the DTD or schema for journal articles um, that's gaining um, real currency and manuscript tracking vendors, several of whom I less of interest to this community I won't mention are also getting on board. So before this is before you actually have these roles um, as real metadata tags, the way in which they're being used um, is just in the kind of format here you can see in this recently published. Um, cell paper, or maybe you can't, there's an author contribution, contribution section, and the author initials are associated with each of those roles where they apply. Um, so we have Nature and Science, PLOS, eLife, um, Elsevier, all getting on board with starting to do that before we even have the actual uh, metadata tags. Now, um, so you can, can also just, I want to come back to the point about how this mindset about capturing contribution is also really aligned with what we're seeing in federal agencies as well. So the new um, biosketch format from NIH is asking investigators involved in team science to provide the, um, uh, describe the specific roles of their work. So you can go outside just the bibliographic, you know, listing of your publication and say, this is actually what I contributed. Um, so there's a lot of, um, you know, interest in, in capturing contribution at a more fine-grained level. But the longer term vision here, as I said, is, is this machine readability. How many of you have heard of, of FundRef? Okay, so some, some people, for those of you who haven't, um, FundRef is um, a solution offered by Crossref to have publishers associate uh, journal articles with the, the funding sources. And so publishers can submit uh, metadata about funding organization and, and particular grant number in association with the DOI. Um, so that's really the model for contrib ref, <coughs> which is, I, I just made that up, it doesn't exist yet, but that's, that's really the vision. So you can imagine a, a contributor role metadata <coughs> collected by publishers during the article submission tracking process, deposited to Crossref, similar to FunRef. <coughs> um, and then ORCID, which is already pulling metadata from Crossref, can then link contributor roles to ORCIDs. So that means that the ORCID system becomes queryable not only for which DOIs did this particular ORCID have a role in creating, but 
what contribution did this ORCID or person make to this particular DOI or work? So ORCID is really at the center of, of this vision. And effectively, an evaluation committee could then pull an individual's authoritative contribution report from ORCID. And this would facilitate the kinds of tenure decisions that I was talking about earlier. So that's the vision. Um, we're not there yet. Uh, I think that libraries can play a key role by encouraging researchers to adopt ORCID. I know many of you are already doing that. Um, and in general, to become smarter about curating their own record of, of impact. I think that um, you know, the library rationale for their role in these RIM and RRR efforts, you know, in the absence of um, the kinds of government requirements that we see in other countries um, is, can also include, that rationale can also include helping researchers and institutions get credit um, for their scholarly output through, through ORCID. Um, so I think that, you know, I think that this is on track to happen, and I think that if we can make it happen, it will have a positive impact on the accuracy of the scholarly record going forward and on the culture of, of the research lab. Think fewer author disputes, happier, better recognized uh, grad students, and, and think of institutions ultimately having access to more nuanced uh, information about their own research contribution and activities. So there's more information about the project at this um, website that you see here, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.